Are you ready for the word? Yes, sir. Leviticus 23. Yom Kippur, like the other feast, um, can be complicated in their details. Um, for instance, concerning Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur, uh, a great amount of study could be spent just looking at the Hebrew word Kippur, which gets translated as atonement. Uh, Strong says that it means expiation. Expiation means the act of making amends for guilt or making amends for wrongdoing. Yom Kippur is um, when you start examining it and, and the things that Yahweh said concerning this day of atonement. Yom Kippur uh, is Yahweh's declaration to us that there is nothing we can do to make amends. You, you study Yom Kippur and you start discovering that the responsibility for making atonement rests upon the high priest. He is the one that will make amends. And uh, of course, Yeshua is our high priest. So a great amount of time could be spent talking about the word Kippur. A great amount of time could be spent in the book of Hebrews discovering how Yeshua is our high priest. A great amount of study could be spent studying the two goats that are used uh, and mentioned in Leviticus 16 connected to uh, Yom Kippur. Um, and though there are a lot of things we could spend a lot of time studying, there are things that I think we have to dedicate ourselves to make sure that we know. Uh, and, and we're going to look at those this morning and beginning in verse 26. Uh, I think the most pressing need is to understand what Yahweh expects us to do in order to keep the feast. And we need to know the details. And I'm not saying we don't need to know the details. We do need to know the details because they are shadows of things to come. And they, they, they reveal to us the life and work of our Messiah. But I think the most pressing need is to understand what Yahweh expects us to do in order to keep the feast. So let's begin reading in verse 26. And Yahweh has spoken to Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you, and you shall afflict your souls, and offer an offering made by fire unto Yahweh. And you shall do no work in that same day, for it is the day of atonement to make an atonement for you before Yahweh your Elohim. Whatsoever so it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever so it be that does any work in that same day, the same so will I destroy from among his people. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and you shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at even, from even unto even, shall you celebrate your Sabbath. <clears throat> so we're told to do four things. First of all, we're told to keep it on the tenth day of the seventh month. Verse 27 said so. Verse 32 says it's to be observed from evening to evening. Therefore, we have to be willing to forsake our Gregorian calendar and our Western way of thinking and uh, adopt the Creator's calendar and keep it from evening to evening. Number two, the second thing we're told to do, <clears throat> pardon me, we're told to have a holy convocation. Verse 27 says so, a sacred set-apart assembly. The third thing we're told to do is to afflict our souls. Again, verse 27 says so. Now verse 27 also mentions that there's an offering made by fire. And to understand how that works, you have to read Leviticus 16. It's talking about the work of the high priest. So we're talking about what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to observe it on the 10th day. We're supposed to have a holy convocation. And we're to afflict our souls. The fourth thing we're told to do is do no work, rest. We're told to do that in verse 28. We're told again to do that in verse 29. We're told again to do that in verse 30. We're told again to do that in verse 31. 
told again to do that in verse 32. You think Yahweh meant for us to do no work? Yes, sir. Think he meant for us to rest? Yes. He stated it five times and he even issued some very harsh warnings about being disobedient in that matter. Well, this morning, <clears throat> again, we could have a theological discussion about Yom Kippur or we could remind ourselves about what Yahweh requires of us. I choose to focus this morning on what he requires of us. So I'm going to go over those four things with you. We've done it before, but I'm going to go over them with us, uh, for us again this morning. Number one, keep it on the tenth day of the seventh month. The Hebrew word that we translate as uh, feast is Moedim. What does Moedim mean? Appointed time. And so when Yahweh sets these things up, he doesn't say, hey, get around to it. He doesn't say, hey, set aside a time to do this. He tells us when to do it. It is an appointed time. So we're not supposed to keep the feast when it's convenient. We're supposed to keep the feast when it's appointed. The, the day they are kept is important because they are showing us things to come. And the things to come will take place on the appointed day. Uh, go to keep your finger in Leviticus 23, but go to 1 Thessalonians 5 for a moment. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of Yahweh so comes as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, <clears throat> as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that, should over that that day should overtake you as a thief. The day of Yahweh comes as a thief in the night, but you are not in darkness that it should overtake you as a thief. The Moedim are, to, are meant to keep us from being in darkness. We are to be rehearsing the shout of Yom Teruah. Yes. And we are to be rehearsing preparation for the great day when Yahweh will judge the earth. We're to be rehearsing. It should not catch us by surprise. So it's important that we make every effort to break free from the calendar of the world and embrace the calendar of Yahweh. On the tenth day of the first month, Yeshua entered into the temple as the Lamb of Yahweh. On the tenth day of the seventh month, Yeshua enters the Holy of Holies as the high priest to make atonement for our sins. We should be preparing and rehearsing that. So we should not be surprised when it takes place. The second thing we're told to do is a holy convocation. That's a command. It's not always easy to keep, but every effort should be made to do so. I, I understand that not everybody can. I, I, I kind of had to grow into that, but I have. I understand not everybody can. I'm learning to be thankful for technology that allows people to connect with assemblies such as ours, Facebook and YouTube. Um, but that doesn't negate the fact that when we read it here, it begins with, uh, like Leviticus 23 verse 2 says, speaking of the children of Israel, saying to them, the feast of Yahweh, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. Even these are my feasts. So Yahweh, when he introduced the Moedim, he said they shall be proclaimed to be holy convocations. All right. I, I, I bring this up because there are so many who have awakened to the truth that the feasts are to be kept and that they are the feast of Yahweh and they have enthusiast, enthusiastically embraced those. But they don't like the part that tells them to assemble with other people to keep them. Verse 2 says, My feast shall be proclaimed to be holy convocations or sacred assemblies with others. Again, I, I know that some people cannot. And I'm not speaking to that. I'm not speaking to those that cannot. I am speaking to those who can, but who do not. Every feast has this mandate that it ha have a holy convocation. Actually, some of them require two holy convocations. What are those? 
which, which feasts require two holy convocations? Sukkot and unleavened bread. That's correct. Very good. I give y'all a gold star, but I didn't bring them with me. <laughs> Yahweh expects us to convocate. Being unable to do so actually is a small fraction of those who do not. Most just choose not to. I've had people get upset with me in the past because I've said these things, but how can I read these verses about the Sabbath and about the feast without reading the parts that say holy convocation? Would, would not be good, would it? The third thing we're told to do is afflict our souls. <clears throat> Traditionally, that has been interpreted to mean that we should fast from sundown on the 9th until sundown on the 10th. And, and I agree, we should fast. That is part of it. We can find biblical support for that. That One of the ways you afflict yourself is <laughs> by fasting, right? Uh, and not to make light of it, but, you, you know, you... Drive past Hardee's to get here, right? So, we afflict our soul through fasting. Uh, however, every year that we have been celebrating this, we acknowledge that it's possible that you can fast and still not accomplish the full meaning of what that word is about. The, the word... Afflict there, afflict your soul. That word means to humble your soul into a place of total submission. The word translated afflict there means a forced submission. You force something or someone into submission. It's the same word that's used to speak of what the Egyptians did to the children of Israel. It says that, that the Egyptians afflicted them, or Pharaoh afflicted them. What did he do? He forced them into slavery. He humbled them and made slaves out of them. <clears throat> this is the word used when Delilah said to Samson, What can one do to afflict you? Well, that should have been a red flag, shouldn't it? <laughs> I mean, what kind of question is that? And he answered it. But what she was saying to him is, what can one do to cause you to be forced into submission? Because all other attempts to force him into a submission failed. She said, what can one do that would force you into submission? It's the same word used to speak of what Sarah had to do to Hagar. Hagar was a servant, handmaid, but when she was found to be with Abraham's child, she got haughty. Genesis 16, 4 tells us that Hagar began to despise Sarah. Genesis 16, 6 tells us that Sarah had to deal harshly with her. The word translated harshly is the same one translated as, as afflict in Leviticus 23. She forced Hagar back into submission. It's a beautiful story. I, I think I brought it up more than once when we're celebrating uh, Yom Kippur because I think it ties in so perfectly with what we're trying to understand about a responsibility concerning this feast. You know, it... Sarah dealt harshly with Hagar. Hagar didn't like it. So Hagar left. Fine, I'll take my baby and go. But the angel of Yahweh found her. And the way he called to her tells us everything we need to know. He called her Sarah's handmaid. He reminded her of her role and her responsibility back in that family. You are Sarah's handmaid and sent her back there. I, I, I like that story a lot. I see it as a warning to us to not make the same mistake Hagar made. Let me explain. We like to re rejoice that we've been adopted and made the children of Yahweh. I'm a child of Yahweh. 
we boast. And that is something to rejoice about. However, Yom Kippur is a reminder to us that Yahweh requires his sons and daughters to be obedient servants as well. Perfectly explained in Philippians 2. You want to read that with me? Philippians 2, 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in the Messiah Yeshua, who being in the form of Elohim, thought it not robbery to be equal with Elohim, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the stake. So, here is the son of Yahweh showing us the example of what it means to be a son of Yahweh. You humble yourself and you serve your father. He afflicted his soul. <clears throat> when facing the prospect of his own brutal murder, which he did not want to endure, he forced himself into submission and then said to Yahweh, Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. That's what afflicting the soul looks like and sounds like. It's becoming obedient even unto death. It's refusing to allow haughtiness and pride to rise up, thinking that we can do what we want to. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm the child of Yahweh. I can do what I want to. No, you're a child of Yahweh. You serve him. So, afflicting our soul is the act of forcing ourselves to be submissive to Yahweh. We, we reflect upon our lives, look back to see where we need to beat ourselves back into submission. Yeah. Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain. And every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beats the air. But I keep under my body. That, that phrase, I keep under my body, could, could be paraphrased this way in the Greek. I attack it like a boxer attacking the face of his opponent. I attack my body with the same zeal that a boxer attacks the face of his opponent. It literally means to punch one under the eye or in the eye. I keep under my body, bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others... I myself should be a castaway. Leviticus 23 says, afflict your soul. We generally refer to the soul as the mind, will, and emotions. Paul said here that he had to subdue his body and bring it into subjection. <clears throat> Here's what we have to understand about uh, forcing into subjection. The greater has to force into subjection the lesser. The body will try to tell the soul what it is and what it isn't going to do. The body will try to tell the soul what it is and what it isn't going to do. The greater has to bring it into subjection. The soul has to bring the body into subjection and say, no, 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 you're not boss on this job. Right? I mean, this applies in so many areas of our life where our body tries to dictate what we can and can't do, and we have to override it. Right? It's not just in the area of obedience. The body has to be forced into submission in order to serve Yahweh. Likewise, the soul will try to tell the spirit what it is and isn't going to do. The soul has to be brought into submission. So the spirit brings the soul into submission. The soul brings the body into submission. 
If we're going to disobey Yahweh and break one of his instructions to us, it's going to be for one of those two reasons. If we're going to disobey Yahweh, break any of his instructions to us, it's caused by one of those two reasons. Either our body does not want to do a certain thing or our body wants to do a certain thing. And it has to be brought in submission. Or our soul is using one of its faculties to talk us out of obedience. The mind is using the mind to reason why we should, why it would be okay. Or the mind is reasoning why it would be better if we didn't. Or the emotions get involved and justify why we couldn't or shouldn't or wouldn't. Or the will that rises up and says, I can make my own decisions. And the body has to be forced into subjection by the soul. The soul has to be forced into subjection by the spirit. But I don't want us to get caught up into overthinking it. The bottom line is this. If we're not obeying, it's because we're no longer in submission. And that has to be fixed. And Yom Kippur is a call to fix it. <clears throat> Listen to this. We do not sin because we want to break Yahweh's law. We break Yahweh's law because we want to sin. And wanting to means that we're no longer in submission. Afflicting your soul means force yourself back into submission. Take yourself into greater depths of forced submission. We have to learn to embrace that phrase. Forced submission. That is how Yeshua fulfilled his mission. He forced himself. That's how Paul accomplished his call. He forced himself. Listen. When people stone you to death, drag you outside, throw you on a garbage pile, thinking you're dead, and you get back up and go to the next town to preach, you had to bring yourself into a whole lot of submission to do that. And he's already got a long list of experiences that tells him he's going to be treated in the next town the same way he was in the last town. But he did it anyway. Peter fulfilled his assignment by forced submission. Not Yahweh forcing him to submit. No, that's not what it is. It's we forcing ourselves to submit to Yahweh. John 15. Look at this with me. Verse 13. Greater love has no man than this. That a man lay down his life for who? His friends. Well, you want to be his friend, right? All right, listen to the next verse. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Well, everybody's my friend. That's not what he says. You're my friends if you do what I command you. So that is a submissive obedience, correct? Verse 15. Henceforth I call you not servants. But wait a minute. Verse 14 requires them to be submissive servants. But in verse 15 he says, I'm not going to call you servants for the servant knows not what his master is doing. But I've called you friends for all things that I've heard of my father I've made known unto you. Yes, you're submissive servants. But, but by being submissive servants, I've been able to enter into a greater relationship with you where I can impart things to you and I call you my friends. Right? That, that's the progression that we're looking for. We afflict our souls into submission so that he sees us as his friends to whom he can trust us with intimate things from the Father. So... 
We're told, number one, to mark the date. Number two, to convocate. Number three, to afflict our souls. And then the last thing we're told to do is to rest or to do no work. And again, he spent more time on this part of the instruction than on any other part. Three times he told us to afflict our souls. That's serious. And, and five times he told us to do no work or to rest. This year, that's easy to do. This year, that's easy to do because it falls on a weekly Sabbath. But, but let me say to you that no matter what day it falls on, we've got to make every effort to do no work. Right. Save a vacation day. If you can't take a vacation day, then just take the day. It's better to offend man than to offend Yahweh. It's better to deal with the consequences of some employer angry at you that you didn't come to work than to deal with the consequences of Yahweh who told you not to go to work. Amen. Yahweh's making atonement for us. His son is now serving as our high priest. He's greatly offended if we go through this day as if it is any other day. It's a great and terrible day. Do no work, afflict your soul. Well, now that we know what to do, I am going to uh, take a brief look at, at some of what's going to happen on Yom Kippur. Luke, excuse me, Leviticus 16. Yahweh spake unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they offered before Yahweh and died. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron your brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not, for I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. So Aaron could not come at all times. He could or would enter the Holy of Holies once a year, and that was on this date. Thus signifying <clears throat> that this is speaking of the work of the Messiah to be done in the last days. In the seventh month is telling us that this work will be done in the last days. Now drop down to verse 5. He shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer his bullock to, of sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall take the two goats, present them before Yahweh at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for Yahweh, the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which Yahweh's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before Yahweh to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. <clears throat> Notice now that Yahweh chooses which goat is which. It's not left up to Aaron. It's not left up to the other uh, priest. It's not left up to the Levites. It's not left up to the people that own the goats. Yahweh chooses which goat is which. Signifying to us that on the great day of judgment, all decisions will be made by him. All. And let me say this to you. The scapegoat does not represent Yeshua. Aaron represents Yeshua. The high priest represents Yeshua. Yeshua has already died as the Lamb of Yahweh. In Yom Kippur, Yeshua is represented not by the Lamb. Yeshua is represented by the high priest. The word scapegoat comes from a Hebrew name. A Hebrew word. Does anybody remember what it is? I knew y'all knew. So quick. Azazel. Who is Azazel? Demon. Azazel is the name of the being who led the rebellious act recorded in Genesis 6. Where the sons of Elohim came down to the daughters of men. That rebellion was led by Azazel. Ain't it 10 10? <clears throat> tells us that Yahweh had him bound in the wilderness, in the desert. And in Enoch 10.10, 10, it says to him 
ascribe all sin. That's exactly what happens on Yom Kippur. <clears throat> Let's go back to, to Azazel. He's bound in darkness until the last day. Every year upon his head are placed all sins. He's not the sacrifice for the sins. He's bearing responsibility for teaching men to sin. His punishment that began in Genesis 6 is pro portrayed from Yom Kippur to Yom Kippur year by year. Now drop down to verse 16. <clears throat> and he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions and all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goes in to make an atonement in the holy place until he comes out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. He shall go out unto the altar that is before Yahweh and make an atonement for it and shall take of the blood of the bullock and of the blood of the goat and put it upon the horns of the altar round about. And he shall sprinkle of the blood upon it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and hallow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. So notice that the people had to be clean. But notice that the outer court had to be cleansed. And the inner court had to be cleansed. This is a picture of the war that is raging in the earth and in the heavenlies. The outer court represents the earthly. The inner court represents the heavenly. Both have to be cleansed of corruption. What do you mean the heavenlies have to be cleansed of corruption? Have you not read where it says, Brethren, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There are spirits all around us, wicked, mean, heavenly uh, 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 beings that are wicked. They have to be dealt with. The heavenly and the earthly have to be cleansed of corruption. The rebellion started in heaven and it manifested on the earth. We wrestle against those principalities. But on the great day of Yom Kippur, our high priest is going to clean house. Yes. It falls upon him to do it and he'll get it done. Peter spoke about that day. You want to read that? Yes, sir. Go to 2 Peter 3. We have a great high priest. 2 Peter 3.10. But the day of Yahweh will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of Yahweh, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be destroyed, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, Wherein dwells righteousness. So Peter is, is referring to and describing for us this great cleansing that's going to take place on Yom Kippur. You know, Sukkot is coming up. Sukkot represents the day that we tabernacle with Yahweh. Yom Kippur lets us know that we cannot do that until heaven and earth are cleansed. Yes. Yom Kippur is when the cleansing takes place so that we can tabernacle with Yahweh. Leviticus 16 ends by telling us that as Azazel is banished, he does not escape judgment for teaching men to sin. But let me say this to you as I close. Hazazel is not held responsible for our sins. We're held responsible for our sins. Hazazel is being held responsible for teaching men to sin. And that's the reason that Yahweh told Enoch to tell him, or Yahweh said to Enoch, to him ascribe 
all sin. And that's exactly what Aaron does. Aaron would take and place his hands upon Azazel and confess all the sins of Israel upon him and transfer them to him. Understanding that he is, Azazel is the one who taught men to sin. Yahweh expects us to take it seriously that he has to rescue us or that he had to rescue us. We rejoice that Yeshua died for us. But Yom Kippur says to us, we should grieve that Yeshua had to die for us. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. As his name is put upon you, so shall he bless you.